And so tonight we continue down. Uh, it's called Ephesus Avenue. Amen. Amen. We're taking a journey down Ephesus Avenue. And we are in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to look at, uh, I won't go back because we only have an hour. And, um, and then we're going to hear by 8 tonight. Amen. Praise God. So let's begin at verse 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here we see Paul focuses on three themes in these verses. You notice that he focuses upon grace, upon salvation, and faith. Grace, yeah, this word occurs 12 times mm. in this letter to the saints in Ephesus. In Paul's time, it carries the meaning of pleasantness. Pleasantness. So when you hear the word grace, it really speaks of pleasantness. Favor or gratitude. People used this word to describe the utter generosity of, that God gives to sinners, even though they don't deserve it. So we get what we don't deserve. deserve. Amen. Thank God for His grace. Amen. Yes. Amen. One brother says, grace is God's ability to ena that enables us to be what he has called us to be yes. and to do what is assigned for us to do. Grace is God's power or the, and his enabling ability that enables us to be what he's called us to be and to do what he's called us to do. This grace is not only forgiveness of sins, which has to do with salvation, but also the gift of God's power in the lives of believers, which brings about the new kind of life. So this grace enables us to live the kind of life that is required there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Two words that are so important there, it's in Christ. In Christ. If any man says, Behold, if any man be in Christ. in Christ, catch here is in Christ. It's not by all good works, it's in Christ. So when God looks at you and I, without Christ, he sees us as fit for condemnation. But when he looks at us with the lens of Christ, he sees us as we are qualified for the blessings that exist in Christ. Number two, we see him focusing upon salvation. Paul used the term saved in these verses to refer to the various aspects of redemption. Whenever the apostle speaks of salvation, he will refer to justification, always justification, reconciliation, and adoption. Whenever you see Paul speaks of salvation, he always speaks of justification, mm -hmm. reconciliation, and adoption. And for those of you, let me just pause right here to speak a little about this area of restoration. Um, you all know the scripture because we spoke about it the last time we came together. From 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 7, it talks about repentance. And we spoke about what is godly sorrow. We spoke about that and we had a great discussion around godly sorrow. And we spoke about in order for someone to be restored, or it's called restoration, that there are steps that need 
to be taken. In order for someone to be restored into a relationship, it needs there are three things that I would say that needs to happen. The first one is repentance. It's not in your notes. You may want to put it there somewhere. It's repentance. Second thing that needs to happen is re sorry. The <laughs> second one, number two, is called R E C O N C I L I O N T I O N. Reconciliation. And the third one will be R E S T O R A T I O N. Restoration. The process of restoration. To re repentance. The kind of repentance I'm speaking about, please understand, I'm speaking about the godly sorrow. I'm not speaking about the world of sorrow. It's the godly sorrow that produces the type of change mm -hmm. that moves you towards reconciliation. It's different from when someone walks up to you and says, I'm sorry. But really, they're not sorry. They're, they're, there's no <coughs> sorrow in there to make the change that needs to, be coming up, that needs to come about. So therefore, they're only saying they're sorry to appease you but the change doesn't bring about the, 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 the sorrow, does not bring about the change that is really needed in the person's life to bring them to a place of reconciliation. See? So because of that, then the relationship is still fractured. It's not at a place that it needs to be. So the reconciliation. So some people, you may observe that some people who fall out of relationship, that they never really get back in a relationship. And it's simply because the repentance piece. And, and let, me, let me tell you how you know that you repent. Let me just share with you how you know repent of an of that. When you see that person, and I'm going to use money because money tends to be one of the conflict that always break relationships. If you don't believe it, listen, you've been wrong before. <laughs> when I was in Africa, I heard Ben say I was a said so, and I believe it. Money, people borrow money from folks and promise to pay them back. Mm -hmm. I promise you, I'm going to give you back your five dollars. But, and I'm giving you back at 12 p.m. on Friday. At 12 p.m. on Friday when I see you, I walk on the other side of the street. <laughs> because I do not want to pay you back. And when I see you, I find I cook up some lie to make you believe, man, you know, I just had some problem. You know, you know, you know, you know I, 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 someone said me because they were in prison. Someone's in prison. You guys, someone's in prison. And folks called me from different places. And while they were in prison, they would not let them go. But they said if they were going to church, they would let them go. So they called me, sent me a text. Pastor, you know, can you tell me what time is your service? And of course, because they knew me and they're in prison for whatever reason, whatever crime they committed against society, they were there. And when they sent me the text, they said, can you send me the church name, the address, and all that stuff? Because I, because the, the, the prison, the place where I'm incarcerated, wants a seat so they can release me to come to church. So, of course, me being people our business, <laughs> but my wife being as wise as she is, says, well, and that's a cop out. I said, baby, people are our business. So I sat down. So Sunday morning, there we are in church and worshiping God. And <laughs> at the end of the service, I didn't see them. So me, you know, being me, jump on my phone a little later. And I said, what happened? Didn't they release you? Oh, yeah, Pastor, I got released. But I had something else to do. And I said, once bitten. <laughs> because they will need my service again. And it may be genuine. It may be genuine. It may be very genuine. They may need it so bad. But guess what? In the back of my mind, mm -hmm. I would always believe mm -hmm. that they want to use me. Amen. So therefore, yep. 
I wouldn't cross that. So I just stay right there. Mm -hmm. So as far as this is concerned, it won't happen until I see them outside and doing what needs to be done, even before we get to this place. Mm. And let me just say something about forgiveness. You see, forgiveness, because this has to do with, this has to do with forgiveness in here. You see, forgiveness, you know you forgive somebody when you can look at them, hug them. Mm -hmm. right. God bless you. It's okay. I don't feel nothing in there. Mm -hmm. I got testimonies that we share with you guys in that, but we'll move on to that. I need to, we only have an hour, so I'm trying to give you guys much. Then he used the word faith, not only grace and salvation, but faith is very essential to the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. This is one of Paul's favorite words throughout the scriptures. You see Paul uses faith. As a matter of fact, right there in chapter 6, he used faith as a shield. He says that we need to put on the, what? the shield of faith. The shield's job is to protect us from the flaming darts of the enemy. It means far more than simply agreeing with an idea. It refers to the total openness of letting God give the benefits of salvation and to obeying the will of God. This does not mean it is something we do by our own ability. Rather, faith is our willingness to let God. That's it. Just thank God. Faith is my ability to just let go and let God. Do I trust God enough? You know, I am. I am. I was reading earlier this week my word about Jesus Christ weeping when he heard. Not when he heard. When he saw the people crying. And Lazarus. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Jesus weeping there. Why would Jesus weep? You, you guys, look, you, you guys, when you read scriptures like these, you must ask the same question because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. Mm -hmm. So therefore, he wasn't weeping because he was powerless. I want you guys to know that. He wasn't wondering. Would I be able to raise him? No. There was no guessing about Jesus Christ of who he was. Amen. Well, what is it that caused our Savior to weep? You must ask. That's a good question we need to ask ourselves. Because you're talking about Jesus yes. looking at this bunch of people that are Jews and he's walking with them and as you watch to them the Bible says he was overcome by sorrow yes, yes, yes. and he was troubled. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says in verse 35, he wept. What is it that moved Jesus to cry? And I, you know, as I study, and I lay there and just closed my Bible right there and I said, Lord, you're not crying because you're weak or powerless. Mm -hmm. What is it that moved the Savior, the resurrection and life? Try to cry. You know what I believe, Brother Kevin? That caused Jesus to cry? That spirit of unbelief mm -hmm. that he saw in the people. Yeah. Even within his own good friend, yeah. Martha. And this is Mary too. Mm -hmm. No people think somebody think it's just, it's just Martha, but Mary too. Because he saw the unbelief in them. Two times in the scripture you find Jesus weeping. Wept there and wept in Luke chapter 19, verse 41. He wept when he saw the condition of the Jews. Not talking about the Gentiles. The Jews. The people whose very nature, their DNA should be believing in God. I want you guys to see, please. The Jews, the, the normal thing, when you see a Jew, right away you think, that person has a relationship with God. It's a natural process. But unfortunately, that did not happen. So Jesus was grieved over the spirit of unbelief that he went. Mm. The Lord said, I believe. 
that the Savior is weeping today. Mm. Because when you look at the state of the church, yeah. 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 the church does not have any faith in God anymore. Mm -hmm. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus Christ said, When the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith? You see, he is saying, When I return, when I come, shall I find you with faith? So the church that is supposed to be faithful has become faithless. And it grieves the heart of God. So people begin to take church, Bible, worship for granted because they do not see the power of God manifested. Because the church that is supposed to be filled with believers is filled with unbelievers. Yes. See? Paul emphasizes, emphasized that salvation is not something um, is not something given because of good works. Salvation is not given because of good works. And we must remember this, that salvation is not given to a person because they do church work. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I need to play, make, make up a sentence. <coughs> No matter how good we are, and we love the church, and do a lot of stuff in the church, please understand that salvation is not merited to any of us, because God looks down and see you're working hard in the church. Yes, I see you. You are an usher. You are a worship leader. You are this or that. Uh -uh. Salvation is not given to anybody, because God sees them working in the church. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is a yeah. gift. And you guys heard me before that the gift always costs the giver. Mm -hmm. But the receiver or the recipient, he just receives it. Doesn't cost the recipient anything but to take it. But it costs the giver. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is not an accomplishment, it's a gift. You also show that salvation does not have its source in men, but in God. Besides, it is God's gift and not the result of our work. That is our forward. Let's look at the believer's walk and we look at some positive things and some negative things. So, positive. Number one. In Christ, and I, may, I, leave it, I left these words up here for you guys to remember everything that we do. In order for it to please God, it has to be in Christ. In Christ. Newness of life. We have newness of life in Christ. We could live a life after the Spirit in Christ. We can walk in honesty in Christ. We can live by faith in Christ. We can do good works in Christ. Outside of Christ is considered fit yeah. in the eyes of God. We can love in Christ. Yeah. We can use wisdom mm -hmm. in Christ. We can walk in truth in Christ. And we can keep God's command in Christ. Outside of Christ, we're unable to do that. Negatively speaking, We are not living our lives after the sinful nature. We can live clean lives. We can live our lives being led by the Spirit of God. We can. It's a choice. I choose to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. There's scripture that I have in Romans chapter 8, but there are not scripture I want to put in there. And if you guys have a pen, you may want to write the scripture there. It's taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5. Mm. Paul writing to the church in Galatia, he says, So I say, live by the Spirit. Choice. Live or walk by the Spirit, and you will not 
gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Bottom line, be spirit led. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Try to allow your lives to be influenced by the Spirit of God. Yes, amen. The problem that we have is there are so many voices mm. that are screaming in our ears. Mm. And because God is not a bully, mm. God is love. God is love. God is not a bully. He speaks quietly. Mm -hmm. It's a part of prayer that, and I'm going to do some um, prayer. I know Andy did something beautiful with us. It's a part of prayer that we do not practice quite frequently here at Destiny. And that's going to happen too. It's a part of prayer that's called listening. Mm. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. Because if prayer is communing with our Heavenly Father, yeah. It's impossible for us to do all the talking. Amen. 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 So we speak and we wait. Mm. So we learn mm -hmm. in agreement prayer. That's very that's something we learn in agreement prayer. That why why one if we are praying for various topics, one person will pray for one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. And then the other person pray for that thing, and then they pray for that, the, whatever they pray for. The beauty in that is, during that time, that period of time, while this person is praying, while, while B is praying for A item, A is listening yeah. to what the Spirit of God is saying mm -hmm. to him or her. It's beautiful when you listen in prayer. Mm -hmm. I have been in prayer circles all over mm -hmm. this country. And one of the one, one of the prayer circles that I love is the one when I get together with my Caucasian brethren, and we were we were we away for our three days of consecration. Just time we spend in God's presence, and because many of these Caucasian brothers, who I love dearly, they do not pray like us. Yeah. Their prayer, many times, is what we call sentence prayer. I'm not quite sure if you guys know what sentence prayer is. Mm -hmm. Sentence prayer, it goes like this. Lord, I love you. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for healing, Mom. The first time I sat with brethren that pray sentence prayer. <laughs> I want you to know that I heard myself snort. <laughs> I'm not used to that. <laughs> but it's prayer. It's prayer. Because prayer is talking and listening. So we need to practice listening. Because the Father has something to say. Amen. 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 Be spirit-led. Be spirit-led. We have the ability to not be led after the manner of men. Mm -hmm. We can live a life free from deceptiveness. We are not living to please men. We are pleasing God. Mm -hmm. Not by sight. Amen. We are not living our lives by sight, mm -hmm. but by faith. Mm -hmm. This is tough. It's very tough. Because we walk by faith. faith and not by sight. So it's tough to do this. Because when there's a need, and I, I you referenced last time we were before you of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you may call it in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4, when our Lord Jesus Christ came off fasting, for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible says, as a matter of fact, Matthew and Luke recorded that he was hungry. Yeah, yeah. And the devil came before him and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stories to bread. Mm -hmm. The devil always strike at us at the most vulnerable times yes, yeah. in our lives. Yeah. When he knows that the need is the greatest, yes. mm -hmm. that's when he come and present 
something before us. But we walk by what? Faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. We live by faith. Sometimes I gotta tell myself, I can't be moved by what I see. Amen. Uh, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, because if I am led by what I see, I can't be here. Yes. No. The fears of life and the horrors that I see. Tonight you were praying about the, this mass shootings. I, I got home from church and my phone didn't stop ringing. Mm. Pastor Cooper, Pastor Cooper, what are we going to do? Just got to walk into a church while we worship in Jesus mm. and just open fire on innocent people. 26 years old, young man. Mm -hmm. That's a baby. My youngest boy is older than him. Mm -hmm. Took innocent lives. Yes. Huh? Ask him, are we going to have metal detectors? No! Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we have no metal detectors. We will do what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. You guys know what Psalm 127 says? Mm -hmm. Anybody knows? Except the Lord, what? Except the Lord, what? Keeps the city. I watch my son, God. We just need to be alert. Amen. We just need to be more alert. Amen. You know, one of the things that I said while I was at Sharma Church is that we need a man to always stand post at the door. Yes, yes. I always, I always press. I mean, we need a brother to stand at the door because we didn't want, you know, we didn't want um, somebody come up. And where Sharma Church is located is right in the hub of all kinds of stuff that happen right there. So we need to always be on the alert. And I mean, Destiny, where Destiny Church is located, right there in Boston, in Grove Hall. That's a hot spot, too. It is. It is. Everything happens around there. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to be tight now, but I'm not depending on you, brothers. <laughs> no, no. No. Thank God for you all. But no. Amen. Amen. God be the glory. Not the vanity of our minds walk in a disorderly manner. Verse 10 says, For we are God's, so we are God's handiwork. And one version says, We are God's workmanship. That's what verse 10 says, right? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to give Jesus some, um, some uh, handout. Um, we you get our sister a handout here, please. Amen. So we are God's workmanship. So in Psalms 139, can somebody read that please? From verse 13. Psalms 139 from verse 13. Yes, thank you, sir. Oh, yes. Who got it? Yeah, somebody got a microphone right here. Amen. I just got it. Oh, thank you. Amen. 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 I need to get a King James Version. I want an NIV version. I know how King. Oh, it's on the screen. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Amen. On the screen. From verse 13. Let's read together, please, everybody. For you created my inmost being. Now the psalmist is speaking to the Lord in prayer. He's saying, Lord, for you created my inmost being. Yes? yes. You, you knit me together. You put me together in my mother's womb. Go ahead, please. I praise, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and wonderful. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Which means that I am God's workmanship. Yes. I am God's masterpiece. Yes. That means in this world, there is nobody like me. Amen. I am the only one in this world like me. Yes, yes, yes. And God for the five children he has given to me, but they ain't like me. They're like Pat. Where is she? <laughs> they're like my wife. Amen. <laughs> I am the only one that God made in this world like me. Amen. And I am the only one that can do what God placed me on this earth to Amen. do. Amen. Amen. Nobody else can do my job. And guess you. what? I can't do yours. Amen. Mm -hmm. You are the only one that's on this earth that like you. Amen. You are unique. Yes, yes, yes. So when folks say something about you, you have to tell yourself, you can talk all you want. I am what? Faithfully am. You can't do this, buddy. I'm only one. When God made me, he broke the mold. <laughs> Said I'll never do this again. I said, 
the name. So God saved us for a purpose. God saved us for a purpose. And Ephesians chapter 1 says it like this. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And turn over to chapter 3, verse 10, please. Chapter 3, verse 10. And in verse 10 he says, uh, Where am I? Verse 10. His intent. Okay, yes, somebody got oh, it's on the screen, yes. Let's go together. His intent. Now remember, remember, verse 4. God chose us in him. Before this world even began. Before he designed the blueprint of earth. And the Bible says, God chose us in Christ. I do not want you guys to forget this, please. God chose us in Christ before this world began. So when God says, let us make man, we were in Christ. See? So he chose us in him before the world began. And that his intention was... That through that church, so as God's workmanship, as God's creation, He didn't just save us so we could look nice. <laughs> and He didn't save us just to escape hell. Yes. Some of us wish, Lord, as a matter of fact, someone said to me, Sir Eugene, someone said to me one time, Pastor, why didn't God just call me home and save me? I said, do you got any unsaved loved ones? Yeah. Yes, that's good. Well, that's why he saved you. Yes, amen. So you can be the person who can pray them into the kingdom amen. of God. Amen. Let's go back into our notes. I'm not in chapter 3, is it? I just took you there to bring you back from there. For we are his workmanship. The term workmanship can also be translated handiwork. We are a work of art that God is in the process of designing. Hallelujah. We are under construction. Yes. Someone says, please be patient with me. God is not finished with me. Yet. Mm -hmm. So, God continue to work upon Lord and Cooper. The day he's finished with me is the day that he doesn't need me on the earth anymore. Yes. He pulls me out of here. Mm -hmm. God but while I'm here, is he continues to prove yes, and look yes, up on yes. And all of us, please understand that. <clears throat> Even what you may be experiencing in your life, please understand that it's designed by God to help the pruning process or the shaping process. Yeah. Jeremiah said so beautifully in Jeremiah chapter 18. <coughs> he says that the Lord said to him, Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah chapter 18. And there I will give you my message. And Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and while he was there, he looked at the potter who was designing some jar, some vessel in his hand. And the scripture says, as he's designing this vessel, the vessel became mad or deformed in his hand. And many times, folks would take that vessel and toss it aside, but no, the Bible says he made something beautiful of it. Yes. So even when the enemy means something for yes, bad, yes, yes, yes. God has a way in reshaping yes, that yes, thing yes, and yes. making it beautiful so that he can be there. Yes, yes, thank yes, you, yes. Jesus. Yes. There is no way the devil could win, Stephanie. Mm. <laughs> the devil can't win. Amen. Oh, Amen. The devil may say, I got you. But God says, uh -uh. you may think you got it. Mm. But I got some mess yes. that you don't know. Mm. Thank you, mm. Jesus. Can you just imagine Job's wife saying to Job, curse God. Mm. Job says, you speak as a foolish woman. <laughs> Maybe he had a good insurance policy. Eh? <laughs> ah, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. This creative process God is carrying out takes place again in these two words. In Christ. In Christ. Christ. It takes place in Christ. 
we are being made anew for good works. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. We are not only being saved from a lot that is negative and destructive, but we are being saved to do good works. This has been God's plan from the very beginning. The apostle using the phrase that we should walk in them. In verses 11 and 12, Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizen of Israel, from the citizenship of in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Mm. This is a sad state. Mm. And we perhaps have family members who believe that, hey, man, God loves me too much. God ain't going to let me go to hell. <laughs> Someone said to my wife and me, just recently, as my wife and I said, they're talking. Pastor Cooper, can you tell me why God allowed me to go through all the mess I'm going through? And I said, well, baby, He's pruning you. <laughs> He's cutting away the stuff that doesn't belong in there. Pruning is not fun. Those of you, any of you, be listen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> pruning is no fun, Shirley. God takes away some stuff that He sees that we are so attached to. I said, hey, see that? Don't get rid of that. Okay? Rid of that. And if we don't, then he knows how to get rid of it. The word therefore signals a transition in the apostles' writing. He'd been discussing the blessings God gave to believers with the emphasis on what believers as individuals had received in Christ. <laughs> he reminded the Gentile believers that they were not part of God's people, but in Christ, they were included. So outside of Christ, but it, they are no good. That's a sad place to be. You know, I, 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 I remember driving to church and seeing folks hanging out by the streets in the summer days, just hanging out. And I thought, oh my God, I just wonder if they have any clue what's really going on. Yes. They're just, they just living. Mm. That's just going on in life. They, you, you mention God to them and they think it's a big joke. Mm. You mention church to them and they say, ah, church is for old folks. Like I used to say, and many of us in here used to say those words. Mm. Until our eyes... Mm. Were open, yes. and we were blind. You know that's why Paul placed emphasis. Such was some of you, and that's why we can't judge people. We can't Amen. point our finger at nobody. We, we, I cannot. I cannot point my finger at anybody, especially those who are unsaved. Mm -hmm. A man who's smoking, a man who's drinking. Man, I won't tell him that. Stop that drinking. I won't tell him stop the smoking. No, because. If I was out there, maybe I would have done worse than him. Yes, yes, yes. Is loving them into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Loving them into the kingdom. Loving people into the kingdom. It's not easy to love the unloved. Yeah. But we have to love them into the kingdom. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard work. This is hard to be saved, but it's harder to win folks who knew you before you were saved. When yeah. you were saved. Mm. It's harder. Because they knew that you ran with them, you drank with them, you shoot drugs with them, you shoot folks up, you run with them. I mean, so they know how you live. And now you're trying to tell them, hey man, that lifestyle is not good. Try to get you to turn from it, but they're not. 
Paul says, outside of Christ, you are without God. How does a man live? Rabbi Zacharias wrote a book some time ago, he says, can man live without God? Just, just, just think for a moment, brothers and sisters. We are in church, we, so have you been saved for many years. But do you remember when you were unsaved? Do, do you guys remember when you were living outside of church, outside of God? You, you know, you, Bible, that's not a good story book, right? Me, you're not going to church? Yeah, party? Yeah, couldn't wait for Friday to come in, get my paycheck. Where's the next party gonna be? Yeah, I mean, no, man. We all know, we've been there, done that, you know what I mean? Yeah, not that brother Kevin, he was safe from birth. I mean, man, I mean, I took his portion. You took his portion, right? <laughs> but we all walk there doing our mess. He explained that those who were separated. From, from the covenant were now being reunited. Those who were once alienated are now reconciled, and those who were far off were brought near. He said, without God. He used the word without God. The Greek word is atheist. The word atheist comes from that word. That means that they are outside of God, so they are atheists. Verse 13 to 18. But now, but now, but now, says the apostle, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The price of the cross. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Christ divided and men is trying to still erect that wall today, even among ourselves, or even within the churches. Even within churches, local churches, there are still walls of hostility. Yeah. 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 Even within churches, mm -hmm. they are what you call cliques. Mm -hmm. They speak over here, oh no, 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 that, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I don't associate with it. This is what I'm, I recall that, um, while I was heavily involved with BMA at the time, that um, there was these various churches in Boston. They had the BMA consists of over 60, of 60 churches in the city. As a matter of fact, I had the number one time. But they were divided. Mm -hmm. they divided meaning that the smaller churches that was supposed to get together and the bigger boys were supposed to get together by themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that was so off. The bigger boys need to share with the smaller boys yes. as to how to get big. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong in my theology. But I just believe if I know something and you don't know it, it's my responsibility to tell you. Amen. 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 You know what happened to that plan? Mm -hmm. It failed. Yeah. Christ took down the wall of hostility yes. that was between the Jews and the Gentiles. They had no association whatsoever. And in John chapter 4, you see there, when this woman came to Jesus, came to the well to get some water, and Jesus sat at the well because he was exhausted from that long trip. And while he was there, he says, can I get a drink of water? And the woman is wondering, who is this rabbi talking to? Yeah. Because, number one, he was a rabbi. Number two, he was a Jew. Yeah. Rabbis don't speak to women in public. Yeah. No. And number two, you are a Jew talking to me, who is a Samaritan? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Something wrong with you, man. <laughs> you go check the doctor. Don't you know the Jews and Samaritans have men in common? Man, there's a hostility wall yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. between us and you. Mm -hmm. it has, it, yes. You guys do not know this, but it has been said in history that the Jews did not want to associate, they, as well, they did not even want to use a utensil from the Samaritan. And the reason for that is because they believed that the women, the, the Gentile women, were always hemorrhaging. Mm. That's what they believed. 
So they believe that Gentile women were always unclean. So they wouldn't eat from them. They wouldn't drink that water from the glass. They wouldn't eat from, they, they wouldn't do anything with Gentile women. They totally pushed them aside. But for Jesus Christ to come to say, hey, as a matter of fact, when you read that text there in John chapter 4, the Bible says Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to. That means that God set it up so that that, that as a matter of fact, John, the scripture in John, when you read John, the Bible says John contains seven miraculous signs. You know, people think that it's just miracles, but no. There are signs. They are speaking volumes. Yeah. When you read something like um, John chapter 4 about that scene, just don't think that it's just Jesus giving, getting a drink of water from that woman. Carries a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus at that moment was tearing down the wall of hostility yeah. Yeah. that existed for generations between the Jews and the Gentiles. Yeah. He was doing something that was unconventional. He was removing that barrier, saying, I want you guys to see why I came on earth. I came to reconcile men to the God. Thank you, Jesus. To bring, bridge that gap again. In Christ Jesus, no, sorry, back up. Apart from Christ, anyone was not a Jew, was hopeless. But now in Christ, but now in Christ, Gentiles and Jews are reconciled to God and to one another. The enmity or barrier that has existed for many years has been removed. This is the meaning of the word reconciliation, which means to bring together bring together. In Christ Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles are one because of his work on the cross. Not only has he made peace, but he is our peace. Now, we both have access to the same Father. Jews and Gentiles, we can now say, Abba Father. I can now say, Our Father. So when Jesus Christ taught them that prayer there in Luke chapter 11, Matthew chapter 6, it says, when you pray, say, not O God, but say, Father. Our Father. Say, Father. And of course, the scripture I refer to there in John chapter 4 is recorded there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So now the Jews can't boast and say, hey, you guys are nothing. But the Jews know, perhaps, is jealous because the Gentiles now who are once outcast yes. now has the same rights. We now have the same privileges yes. that the Jews have. Yes. Yes. We can call this God. Mm -hmm. We can call their God. The God who delivered them from the cruel hand of Pharaoh. We can call that God our God. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. We can say our Father. Mm -hmm. That created a jealousy between the Jews. Yes. You find it there in Romans. When Paul was talking about it. So God made the Jews jealous by bringing the Gentiles mm -hmm. in. You know, some of you have, have been here, so you have to see this little thing that I draw on the board. I want you to see, that's why Paul called it a mystery. Yeah. Because nobody was able to do this. Mm. Nobody. And I believe this segregation that we are talking about, I, I believe it's Almighty God that really, because God set up like this. Because in this world, God wanted a selected group of people that he could call his own. The world was made up of all these different groups of people. But God wanted a set of people 
that he will call his own. So what God did, he called a man by the name of A, what? B-R-A-H-A-M. And from Abraham, God created a bunch of people that's called what? The Jews. And God says, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God wanted a group of people that would be the pipeline from heaven to earth. And he wanted this group to be his conduit that heaven, that would bring heaven on earth. The problem with that was that these Jews were part of this generation that's called sinners. They are all sinners. It becomes it became problematic. So therefore, God wanted to bless the world, but how are you gonna bless the world through sinners? It becomes very problematic. Mm -hmm. So God has to come up with another plan. And what God did, he says, well, you Jews messed up. You Gentiles have no part with this. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. That's what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 15 to the woman, right? Mm -hmm. He says, hey, it's not meat for me to take the children meat and give it to them. Oh. So basically he's calling anybody who's not a Jew a dog. A dog. Yes. So he's actually saying, you Gentiles have no no part, no portion mm -hmm. in this thing called the covenant. No. So what God had to do, he had to come in the form of man yes. and grab some folks from the, from the Gentiles, you know, because he, any, anyone who received him, because he came unto his own that day in John chapter 1, he came unto his own and his own received him not, but to as many as, so basically he says, I call, I'm calling you guys. Come, 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 come. And, no. So he says, okay, anybody want to come, come. And that's what happened to us. Now God calls some folks from the Gentiles. And he grabs some Jews who want to be part of his call. And he called this group now, this new group that he called. He creates another group of people that he called the church. Or in the Greek, the Ecclesia, which is made, simply mean the called out ones. He called some people from here, he called some people from there, and he formed this new group of people, or this new group of humanity that's called the church. And from the church, it is simply his will now that through the church, the earth will be blessed. Through the church, the earth will be blessed. So if that church messed up, mm -hmm. I want you guys to follow me, please. He is saying, it's through the church, the earth will be blessed. Can you see now why 2 Chronicles seven fourteen is so important? If my people, you see, God wants to bless the yeah, earth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But the problem why the earth is not being blessed is not the government. Yes, yes. It's not Donald Trump either. Yes. The problem is not with our young people that are not going to church. The problem is with us, yes. the church. Amen. Because the church has has forsaken the assignment from Almighty God. Mm. And therefore the earth suffers. Yes. Believe you me, but when for a young man to walk into a church a Sunday morning with a weapon and shoot people that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody stole his, his turkey from the oven. I mean, I mean, just went and just, I mean, just. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, because that is not normal. Mm. That's right, because in South Carolina, just that's a, a few years ago, and yeah, that young man went to the church in South Carolina and shot up some people mm -hmm. as they are worshiping God. It's not normal, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And that church is responsible. I don't care yes, nobody yes, tell yes, me. Yes, the yes, church yes. is responsible. Amen. We have failed God. Mm -hmm. We're doing everything that God says not to do. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Therefore, the word is saying, 
Where am I going to get some help from? So the church now follows the world. You guys see what's going on? The church now becomes the follower of the world. The world is leading the church. My God. We are in trouble, and our children are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brother Taylor. Sister, if we, if we peel back the layers on this, and, and you know, it surely doesn't uh, in any way change his, uh, his, sorry, his, sorry. his, change his sovereignty. But, but, but uh, Pastor Teresa, give me this. Okay. 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 As in, in, in no way does this challenge God's sovereignty. So he had to know, I mean, nothing goes on, on you know what I mean? Yes, he sir. doesn't know about it and plan. So the Jews fall out of line, if you will. Uh, and he turned to the people, to the Gentiles. But to bring it forth today and where we are and what you're confessing now, and this is not the issue of God thing because we know his way is not our way, but what, what, is, what does this lead us? What's the call here? The call here is that the church has gone into a warm state, you know? And I think Revelation, we haven't even gone into the book of Revelation yet, but in the, in the, the church has gone into what you call a state of stupor, um, lukewarm where we have neglected our assignment. Mm -hmm. We have become, I, I, I don't want to use this word because we been further along too much, but I may just use it for the purpose. The church has become like a sleeping giant mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So we are more concerned about me, mm. myself, mm -hmm. my members, my members, like if any pastor died for anybody, it, it hurts me when I hear people say, you are my people. Mm. I always ask them, did you die for anybody? <laughs> you said that for anybody? God has called us to be under shepherd. That's yeah, all it is. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. And we, we, we miss our assignment. Yeah. So Jesus Christ said to Peter in John chapter 21, Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, yes. Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you more than these. And Jesus Christ commanded to Peter, who was the oldest disciple, the leader of the disciples, Jesus Christ said to him, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. And then, he asked him again, yes. Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you more than these. This time, he didn't say feed, but he said, take care of my lambs. Mm -hmm. Talking about the seniors and the next generation. Yeah. We have a big responsibility, man, as pastors, to teach the people of God, to prepare yeah. people, God's people for works of service. Yes, yes, yes. And when we fail to do that, when we neglect our assignment, we find ourselves like in the book of Ezekiel, blowing a false trumpet. Mm -hmm. So people can distinct the song. What song are we sending? Is the enemy coming? Mm -hmm. Or that's a false song that we're giving people. Mm -hmm. So people do not know which way to turn. So people are confused. And people are searching, running from here to there. People are jumping from church to church, trying to find. And, ah, what is that here? Is there? Is it? And, because we have failed yes. the people. Yes. We have failed the people. Yes. yes, God is omniscient and God knows because God always has a plan. But because God does not force or coerce anyone, yes. He left us to say, Yes, Lord, I serve you. Only in response to the cross of Christ does peace exist vertically between man and God. Between mankind and mankind. This is faith. Paul also pictured the church as a nation. He used the words fellow citizens also as a family. He used the word household. Also, he called the church a building. This building is being built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The purpose of the church is to become the dwelling in which Almighty God resides by his Spirit. So the church is supposed to always experience the presence of Almighty God. Always. Amen. And let me just pause here, please. Whatever we do in the church, brothers and sisters, please hear me. Whatever you will do in the church, please remember to do it as unto the Lord. Amen. 
If we see ourselves coming to church because of another person, you miss your blessing. If you give and you do not give it in faith, you waste your giving. Please understand that faith is the only thing that God smiles on. If you can do it in the flesh, forget it. Yes. And, and, and I love what Paul says there in Philippians chapter 2 that we must have the same attitude like Christ. Yes. Because Paul knows that if we're going to please God, you have to have the same mindset like Christ. Don't talk it, but live it. Yes. That when Paul addressed the church in Colossae or the church in Philippi yes. or, he, he, or the church in Galatia, any of these churches that Paul addresses, Paul uses words like these. When I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus, and I see the love that you have for one another. In other words, the faith that I hear about, I want to see it by your demonstration of love yes. between one another. Jesus. Don't tell me you love me. Show me. Amen. That's what he was saying. If you claim that you love, mm -hmm. I need to see it manifested yes. among them. Amen? Amen. Amen. You have five minutes and I'm on that. Amen. In this chapter, we see, I'm sorry, in this chapter we see where those who were separated from the covenant have now been united. That's me. Thank you, Jesus. Those who were alienated have been reconciled. And those who were far have been brought near. Jews and Gentiles are no longer strangers, but they are called into one hope as one people of Almighty God. Amen. Amen. So now, when God is at the church, He does not see Jews. He does not see Gentiles. But He sees the church. He sees my people. He sees the people that try to live for Him. And people who live by faith. He sees us as one. Amen.